Welcome to the Next Talk Podcast. We are passionate about keeping kids safe in an overexposed world. It's Mandy and Kim, and we're navigating tech, culture, and faith with our kids. Hey guys, it's Mandy and Kim on the Next Talk Podcast today, and we have a very, very special guest. Pastor Robert Emmett is here. Hi, everybody. If you guys don't know Pastor Emmett, he is, he founded the church where we started, and he God used Robert to grow that church from like a zero to 20,000 people. So Robert has been through it. In the middle of all that, he's raising three kids too. So he has a lot of advice to talk to us about all sorts of things. But today we're focusing on parenting. But Robert, first, I want you to just introduce yourself. Tell us about your family. Um, Tell us about anything that you want to share with us. All right. Uh, I'll give you the short version. I was, I'm Robert Emmett. I was born in Hollywood, Florida, grew up in Memphis, Atlanta, New Orleans, and San Antonio. Uh, my dad was in corporate America and got transferred about every four years. And when we got to San Antonio, he told the company no more transfers because we were in middle school and high school. So 69 on San Antonio was home for us. Uh, I'm the youngest of three. Um, I'm an introvert by nature. And uh, about half the the large church pastors are, and people are always, <laughs> no way, yeah, way. <laughs> Introvert doesn't mean we we don't like people. It doesn't mean we we can't speak or do that. It just means we recharge alone. <laughs> an extrovert like Ed Newton, who took over CBC from me, which he's awesome. He's an extrovert. At the end of Sunday, I'd go home on the back porch and watch the sunset all by myself. Ed, he plays basketball with six or seven other guys. So that's the difference between introverts and extroverts. Had no desire to be in ministry. Grew up in church. Wonderful family. Great parents. Uh, they lived married 46 years and before my dad passed away. But great brother and sister. So a good, normal life. I was uh, uh, not the brightest teenager. I have always had a need for speed and thrills. So uh, I have met a lot of police officers along my, my driving journey. They were all very nice and I just figured they wanted my autograph, and I was happy to give it to them. <laughs> Probably could have paid for a college education for what I paid in speeding ticket. But went to a and got a degree in uh, ag economics originally. I wanted to be a wildlife and fishery bi- biologist. Uh, I dreamed of working in the Rocky Mountains, away from people and working with animals. And uh, when I guess after my freshman year in, in college, I felt the Lord calling me into ministry. I didn't even know what that meant. Went to my pastor over at Castle Hills, and I said, uh, I don't even know what you guys do, but I can't get rid of this idea. I said, for all I know, you play golf on Sunday and or Monday through Friday and preach on Sunday. And he laughed, and he said, well, we do a little more than that. But he didn't overwhelm me with it. He just said, let me ask you this. If the Lord opens the door for you, will you walk through it? And I said, well, yeah. And I said, what do you mean opens the door? He said, gives you opportunities, things like that. I said, yeah. And he said, well, then let's get on our knees and tell the Lord that. So we did. And I got up and I had peace. It's kind of like, okay, it's on the Lord's shoulders, not mine. I went to the preacher. We prayed. So, Lord, if you open the doors, you know, I'll walk through it. Went back to college and uh, the Lord opened the door to be a Bible study teacher for a youth group. And I did that for a while. The preacher's kid was in my class and he was a senior in high school. And he loved, uh, you know, making a fool out of me. I thought I was just kind of there to babysit high schoolers. And, you know, he embarrassed me, made me so mad. I started studying my lesson. So I knew what I was going to be talking about. (laughs) (laughs) That was my journey into the youth world. Then uh, served as a youth pastor for a summer, for a summer, went back to A&M my junior year and uh, went to the student ministries department, Baptist Youth Student Union. I said, if you ever need a preacher, I'd like to try. And the guy said, have you ever preached? And I said, yeah, once on a Sunday night. And he said, how'd it go? I said, I hated it. He said, really? (laughs) I said, yeah, I I had a 20-minute message, and it was over in nine minutes, and that hot red flush, you know, it was there the whole, I wouldn't even let my parents come to it because I didn't want to embarrass them. And after that, I said, I will never preach again. I hate this. But after a summer with my mentor pastor, he said, just tell the BSU guy. So I did. Checked in on a Friday night, you know, before semester started on, on Monday, Hadn't him unpack my truck, went to the BSU, and I said, if you need a preacher, I'd like to try. And after I told him that, he hands me a name and a number. And he said, call this man and tell him you're the preacher this Sunday. Uh, Okay. So (laughs) I go to my dorm room. I get on the phone, call the old man. My roommate comes in, and he hears me saying, 
hey, I'm your preacher for this Sunday. And the guy says, okay, be there at 1045. Church starts at 11. And then my roommate says, what are you doing? I said, I don't know. I'm about to preach this Sunday at a little country church. And and he just laughed at me. He wasn't much of a believer at that time, but went and preached at the church. Funny experience about it. You know, I walked in, met the old man, and introduced myself and a little country church. One of those light, little white churches you drive by on your vacation. You wonder, does anybody really go to those on Sunday? About 10 people do. And that's usually two or three times. <laughs> About 10 people. <laughs> I, I walked in. He shows me the pulpit. I had my message ready. And I said, who leads the music? And he said, uh, the preacher. And <laughs> I said, oh, man. I said, well, who plays the piano? And he said, well, the preacher's wife. And uh, I said, well, I'm not married, but I, I can play the piano. So, uh, you know, sang a few songs. And then I preached my message, said goodbye to everybody. And the old man met me at the door when I was about to go out. And he said, you did real good. And I said, thank you. And he said, uh, can you come back next week? I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. And then he pauses and he says, do you think you can find a singer? Oh. <laughs> in, the king, in the kingdom of heaven, that was a pivotal Sunday because was Robert the piano player? Was he the singer or was he the preacher? And uh, the, old, would... the old man helped me discover my role. I was the preacher. <laughs> I was just getting ready to say, what if he said, can you bring back a preacher next Sunday? <laughs> I'm leading worship right now. <laughs> Could have been a whole nother life experience. <laughs> so that, that kind of started, I was a junior, you know, started pastoring uh, full time in September, October, and was a little country church, rural church, small town church in Navasota, bigger church in Weatherford, finished up seminary, came to San Antonio, started Thousand Oaks Baptist Church, stayed there five years, started churches from it. It grew, the Lord blessed. Then we went to the mission field for a year, and then we came back. And I, on the mission field, I had said one night, just listening to uh, Hosanna Praise tapes. Back then, they were cassette tapes. I'd never heard of them, and I asked one of the other missionaries, I said, what's that? I said, it's a, it was the Give Thanks album. And I, he said, listen to it. And I went home and listened to it. I mean, I just started crying. I said, Lord, if I ever pastor again... I'd love to have this kind of music. And then uh, that just kind of prompted me. I started writing down, if I ever pastor again, you know, this is where we'd meet, how we do it, ushers, greeters, people, church, baptism. I just, everything I'd, you know, learned over 13 years of pastoring, the good stuff I kept in the bad stuff, kind of wrote that out. And anyway, we got home in, uh, I guess, March or April, and then started Community Bible Church in May of 1990 on a Sunday night. And, uh, you know, we had a hundred people show up, a lot of them that I'd known that I'd pastored while I was there before. And then uh, we started there and then met in a movie theater and then got a shopping center and a bigger shopping center, moved out to 1604. And, I mean, the Lord just kept blessing it. I'm a left-handed Aggie, so, you know, you know, it's never going to be complicated, but I never dreamed I'd be a preacher, period. And I certainly never wanted to pastor a large church. And I had preached that quite a bit when we were, you know, three or four or five or 600 people. I said, I'll never pastor a mega church. And then when we grew to 10, 15, 20,000, they all like to joke and say, hey, I thought you were never going to pastor a mega church. I said, I don't. I pastor pastors and they pastor the mega church. So. <laughs> you never, never say, say never. never. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but now, now, 40 years later, I'm up here in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado living my original dream. <laughs> ah, full circle moment. That's yep. so cool. Well, we've got, Julie and I got married young, uh, had three kids. Her background and mine were worlds apart. Uh, mine was, as she put it, I was raised in the Beaver Cleaver family. And uh, she said, the only thing is your mom didn't vacuum with pearls around her neck. She <laughs> was raised in a little more challenging situation, went through some of the challenges of broken families and things like that. But we met and fell in love really fast and got married like 10 months after we met. So been happily married. We're celebrating 45 years uh, tomorrow, going on a nice cruise, just the two of us. But three kids, 42, 40, 35. The oldest is a preacher. Uh, the middle one's a school teacher and a, and a pastor's wife. And then the youngest is a firefighter up here in Fort Collins. So we got seven grandkids ranging in the age from 16 to six. And uh, we moved up to Colorado to watch grandbaby number seven grow up in the last five years. I, if any of you have a parent or grandparent, you'll love this, and you'll probably clip it and make this the only piece. 
But if you got a grandparent, if you're a grandparent, make sure you live in the same city as a preschool grandchild. Oh, it yes. will change your life. First of all, you're free babysitting for your kids. But <laughs> second, everything is brand new. I mean, you'll spend two hours catching grasshoppers and butterflies and everything's just, oh, from the eyes of a two and three and four year old. It's been the best, most fun five years I've ever had in my life. That's wow. amazing. That's a long I, version, but that's kind of the, the thumbnail version of it. But love life, love Julie, great kids, our marriage, never had a never had a bad day. We've had a few tense conversations, but no one ever stormed out of the door, the house or the room or none of that. We always made sure because the Bible says don't go to bed angry. So anytime we had a disagreement at night, we just hugged and kissed and said, we'll, we'll talk about it again tomorrow. Okay, I love you, love you. And that was it. And we did, you know, you talk every day, you hardly ever raise your voice. So you just have conversations. I love the way you tell your life story because it's the same way that you preach. And that's what <laughs> really, it's just, you're such a Don't wonderful storyteller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but it's just. People are going to get up and walk out if I stop and take a breath. <laughs> it's just relatable. And it just makes you feel like this warm feeling of getting to know someone who's genuine, loves the Lord, loves his family. And. I think all of us want more of that. We want those types of relationships. So it's just, it takes me back to when we found you in San Antonio at CBC. And my husband said, we found our church. And he just said, he is like who I want to be, you know? And so we have just loved raising our kids at the church and getting to be um, ministered over by you and your friend. Julie held our baby in, in the <laughs> hospital. And she, you just have a wonderful family that has blessed us so greatly. So it's such an honor to have you on our show today. Well, it's been fun. You know, as a single country pastor and I'd preach on, you know, parenting and all that, everybody laughed. Oh, you'll change that when you have children. And I, how can I change it? This is what the Bible <laughs> says, you know, don't provoke your children to anger and, you know, show them the path and all. And we had kids and I started practicing what I'd been preaching. And I mean, the word of God works. If you just, like I always say, trust Jesus, read the New Testament, and do what it says. It'll change your life. And you go, wow, this is not nearly as complicated as we make it if we just do the simple stuff and the basic stuff all the time. Amen. That's so true. That's so true, Robert. A couple things. One is I I've always loved your humility. I mean, you are you are a powerhouse. <laughs> and to hear you tell your story, you're just a left-handed Aggie walking through a door of obedience <laughs> every day. And honestly, that's all of us in Jesus, right? And we all have mm -hmm. the whole, the same amount of the Holy Spirit if we're just willing to be obedient. And that's why I love your story. You just were obedient and God was showing you things and God used you mightily um, and is still using you. And the second point that I was going to say is when you said, you know, the Bible has the word of God, I think so many times today, you know, at next talk, pe parents get overwhelmed with, oh my gosh, we have technology and, and now they're exposed to that. And it's true. I mean, the world is changing, but the word of God is not, and it is still the solution to keep our kids safe. Absolutely. That Deuteronomy six, six, and seven, you know, talk to your kids, create a culture of conversation in your home, talk to them on the go at home, getting up and going to bed. And that is a solution, no matter how much the world changes. And that's why your parenting wisdom here, I mean, you've got so much that I want to dive into today. <laughs> you know, this, and to the audience, this morning I woke up and I had done a, spoke to the parents and teenagers and all that. And I woke up, I had a sheets of the one-liners, bullet points for parenting and all. And I thought, I got stacks of notebooks. I'll never find that. And I just started, I said, Lord, if you're in this, if you want me to find them, then let me find them. And I started with big, thick notebook. And I just started scrolling and I thought, I'm never going to find it. And I started from the back and boom, there was my one pager right there. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and then I found the, the extended version there and I reread them and I thought, wow, this stuff, it still works. You know, identify your children's talk time and make the most of that moment, whether it's going to school or home or bedtime or lunch, whatever, just, just common sense stuff. It, you know, and if you, you read it, and like I, I was telling Mandy, I said, I just, we read the parenting books of our day, which, you know, we're 35 and 40 years old now, but, you know, I'd read them and highlight them, but then I'd just make the little bullet points, you know, because, you know, for me, it's don't tell me why I have to do it. Just tell me what I'm supposed to do and I'll do it. Yes. And uh, for some of you, you're highly educated, so you won't know why you have to do it, but I'm nice and simple. So I just say, Lord, what am I supposed to do? I'll do it. And that's it. But I mean, 
and you've got books today and you're writing them and there's others that are writing them. A whole different culture for me. And I, I tell my kids, boy, I'm sure glad y'all are grown up. I just get to play with my grandkids and don't have to mess with all the stuff they have to deal with. It's the fruit of all your hard work is you get this, <laughs> this sweet season with your grandkids. Oh, man, when you play with those grandkids for the first time for a weekend and hand them back, woo! <laughs> my daughter-in-law daughter was so awesome because, you know, we handed ours off to our grandparents, my parent in-laws, and, you know, here's when they go to bed, what they candy can eat and all that. And uh, when Victoria brought Elise over here for a weekend, uh, I said, okay, what are the rules? And she's a dietitian and just, you know, very organized. And I'm thinking I'm going to have two or three sheets of, you know, rules when she goes to bed, <laughs> what eats and all of that. She said, just two rules. I said, two? And she goes, yeah, make sure she's safe and loved. I can fix everything else. Oh. I love that. <laughs> I did too. I said, we'll keep her anytime. I guarantee you she'll be safe and loved, but we'll have a fun time doing it. <laughs> that's, that's a awesome. that's a good little sample of how to be a good daughter-in-law right there. <laughs> yes. Take <laughs> notes. My in-laws, they said, you know, when y'all gave us those rules, as soon as you pass the kids off, we wadded them up and threw them in the back of the car. <laughs> <laughs> that's what grandparents have done since the beginning of time. So true. That's true. That's true. I've, I've always said to my my parents, like, I want you to spoil your grandkids and do all the things, like have all the fun with them, you know, and and I always reiterate that to them. Like, I, I'm not trying to take anything away when I say, please don't let them be on YouTube or whatever. I don't want that. I want you making memories, you know, and spoil them. Use all that yes. time. Especially with the preschoolers, you know, because there's everything's new to them. Trees and leaves and climbing and pulling weeds and planting seeds and catching crawfish. It's kind of like you know, that we don't do that. You know, occasionally she'll watch her little Disney shows or whatever, but most of the time, and Julie, you know, she's, I always tell people, if you want Julie to speak, she'll freeze up on you as soon as she starts. But if you give her a room full of 500 preschoolers, she will have them laughing and playing games and having a wonderful time in 10 minutes. <laughs> she has a gift for sure. Oh. And like our house, I mean, it's kind of like Disneyland for my granddaughter. Every time she walks through the front door, every room's a playroom. And every piece of furniture, every everything is a, a creative device or a toy for a play or something. It's just, it's wonderful. Amazing place for grandkids, for their creative outlets. Now your listeners are going, golly, I wish we were there now. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we were in the trenches where you are a few years ago. So hang in there. I'm telling you, there's there's light at the end of the tunnel and it's wonderful. You're in the promised land, Robert. Yeah. You're in the promised <laughs> land. We are over here suffering. We are <laughs> looking for our daily manna. Is what like, where is for. the milk and honey flowing? <laughs> where is it? <laughs> All right. So as if you guys start to listen to this show, you're going to hear so many examples of things we've shared on the podcast before that come straight from Robert Emmett from his sermons that we always say. One of the things we say all the time, Robert, is your kite example. We use that all the time. I wrote about it in my book. I explain it to our listeners because it's so good and you you say it way better than than I can say it. Raising your children is like flying a kite. You know, you're you got the kite, you put it all together, that's birth and things, you tie your string on there. And then you go out and you let the kite out into the wind because your job as a kite flyer is to get the kite up in the air. Your children, your job isn't to hover and just keep them around all the time. Your job is to let them go further and further out. And so you're just doing the string thing. The kite's going higher and higher and you're having a great time. They're having a great time. That's the way it should be. But then the winds change or something happens and the kite starts kind of looping or diving or whatever. When that happens, you reel it in as fast as you can. And then you start all over again. And eventually your children, you know, they're going to screw up and mess up and do things and start doing loops and all. You know, it's like when you when they're teenagers, you know, hey, congratulations, you're 16, you're driving, you can stay out till midnight. And then they come in at one o'clock, you reel it them in right back to, hey, we're starting at 10 o'clock next week. What? Yeah, you know, you, you went crazy. So you're reeling you back in and then you start all over. Eventually, they're way above the clouds. You don't even see them anymore. They graduate. They go away. And you're having a great time. After the, after the big college cry, then you're, you're saying, you know, this empty nest thing isn't so bad. But your children are still out there, and you still feel the tug once in a while. Maybe a call or a text or I got to come home or something. But you'll always be in touch with them. But 
Kill children are like kites. Our job is to let them out, get them up as high as they can go in their direction. When they mess up, we bring them back down, start it all over again. But eventually they're gone and they have their kids and they start the process. I can't imagine how many of us parents who were kind of raised by <laughs> your preaching have told that story to our spouse and to our kids. Like all my kids know the kite story. We <laughs> use it all the time. And we've told it to our listeners, like Mandy said, so many times because it's such a great analogy. It really makes it come alive. Like what our role is in the season of life as parents, young parents and parents with teens and then adults. It's like, we've got to let them go. We got to get them above the clouds. That's something Mandy and I were talking about a few weeks ago. We were talking on the phone, and, and she said, what's the thing you said about zero to 12 or whatever? And I said, yeah, a parent in a child's life, when, you're, when your kids are zero to 11, you're the authority in their life. You know, you say do it, and they do it. You know, they don't, if they're running out in the street, you say stop, and they just stop. They don't say why or no, I don't have to stop. I mean, you're the authority. You're the ultimate. You're bigger. You're stronger. And they know that, and you know that. Then when your child turns 12, then from 12 to 17, you become an advisor in their life. Because now they got other friends, they're looking for acceptance from others, mom and dad. I know y'all love me, but you know, they want to be accepted by others. So they start, you know, move like the kite, they start flying up. Human beings worldwide, we're all natural, we're all on the same thing. And when we hit 12 to 15, 16, there's that pulling away from mom and dad, and we're going on our own. Children, teenagers get it. Parents don't. Children, they naturally transition from mom and dad or everything, whatever they say goes to, hey, there's other opinions out there and there's other ideas and music and teachers and leaders and friends and all of that stuff. And that's the point for a parent. I tell them, this, you're an advisor. You know, your, your child is a teenager now. They're driving, they're school, they're making decisions. And when you say, because I said so, that's why, you know, you tell them to do something, do this. Why? Because I said so, that's why. And when you hear yourself say, because I said so, that's why, that's when I want you to remember this podcast. Because when you say, because I said so, that's why, you just reach the lowest common denominator of a parent. That's, that's bottom. They don't do it because you say so. They do it because you say, you know what? Glad you asked that question. Here's why. And here are the things that can happen when you do this or when you don't do that. You know, you're a teenager. You're making the decision. I'm your advisor. So I'll tell you. This, I know from experience, will happen or won't happen. And, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to make some mistakes, and when they do, you let them. But ter parents of teens, are, you got to see yourself as the advisor. And I've had more parents than I can count when I preach that. And they say, well, I'm still the authority. Yeah, you are. You're paying the bills. It's your house. It's your insurance and all that. But if you're pulling the authority card, then you haven't transitioned to the advisor yet. You know, and when your kids mess up, okay, the authority, you know, you, you can stay out till 12 and then you're coming back to 10. That's that, you know, kind of thing. But then when your kids turn 18, 18 and beyond, you're a friend. You know, if you haven't gotten the right stuff in their mind by 18, it's not going to happen. So that's why you start them really young, train up a child in the way they should go. When they're older, they won't depart from it. Uh, you know, we all have our moments getting away from things, but eventually we realize, man, what mom and dad said, they're right. And they come back to it and then they begin to live it themselves. But uh, parents, if you're listening, if you got little children, you're the authority. Right and wrong, do this, don't do that. And here's why. The teenagers, this is what I would do. If I were you, I'd date this person or not date them or hang around these friends. Or I, You might think about changing friends because these are getting you in trouble. But your decision and you support them in their decision. And then when they're 18, you're just, that's a fun state. That's, that's when they come in. You don't have to correct them. You don't have to change anything. You just love them and share life with them. I just have to say here really quick, that was one of my favorite sermons when, you know, years ago and I heard it, but you had one more stage in there that has really ministered to my mom. Like once your kids become parents themselves. Oh yeah. That's the, that's kind of walking with them. And that's the. Like supporting stage. I want to say yeah. it was something like that. And that's why I say, you know, with the grandparents, Man, live next to your grandkids if you can. If you're still working and you can't, I get it. But if you can be close to your kids or you, you know, parents raising kids, if, if you're doing this job in this state, but you could do the exact same thing in the city where your parents are, I'd switch and go over there. Because, again, free babysitting, but your grand, your parents, the grandparents, they'll speak wisdom into their your children just naturally. And then eventually the kids start asking grandma or grandpa, 
what was it like when you did this or that and all of that? You know, what was it like when the phones were on the wall and connected? <laughs> oh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's such a, a precious thing to have wisdom um, poured into our kids from their grandparents. And for us as parents, for the grandparents not to, you know, try and dictate this is how you should parent, but to be there and support Yes. And be as available as they can as we're going through the hard part of parenting is such a gift. And, and tell your parents or you, you parents, tell your parents, the grandparents that, you know, please don't say back in the day. You know, every time you say back in the day, we just go, you know, out of, day, <laughs> out of touch. Just speak naturally from the heart, you know, and deal from the heart and the wisdom and God's word. And, you know, one of the things I teach a lot is. The final decision maker is what does God say I should or shouldn't do? And if you'll do that, I mean, then you follow the Lord of the universe. He wrote the rules. And if we'll abide by them, you know, we stay on the tracks and life goes really smooth. But grandparents, uh, you know, and hopefully you got great kids. And sometimes you got a lot of grandparents raising their grandkids now. And that's a toughie. We have some friends doing that. And it's kind of like Julie and I just, I would hate to be raising a child right now at 67 you know, and, and, and going to every little PTA meeting and all that stuff. So, but if you're a grandparent, you're watching, uh, if you are that one raising your kids, you don't have the energy to keep up with the grands, but find somebody that does a coach, a team, a teacher programs at church. There's somebody out there that you can say, look, I need some help and they will be glad to help you. We, we are made for community. God, yes. that's how God made us. Um, I love going back to that switch to the advisor to uh, authority to advisor. I think most parents miss that, Robert. Yeah. I, I think most, and we get stuck there. And even when they're 40 and they're parenting their own kids, we're still trying to be the authority. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we see that. And I think that's what Kim was trying to say too, instead of, you know, not being in the supportive role. And I think that's a key thing that I, I, I got from you over the years was to let your kids grow up because I do think there's this tendency to bubble wrap and smother and helicopter. And that's just going to create tension and lies. Okay. Your kids are going to sneak behind your back and all of that because we're, we're we can't let go. Yeah. And it's uh, when we got married, my father-in-law and he's wonderful and he lives right downstairs. Now he's 89 been living with us for six or seven years since his wife passed away. But when we got married, uh, he told me, he said, called me Brother Rob. He said, Brother Rob, unasked for advice is interference. If you want my opinion, ask for it. Otherwise, I'll keep it to myself. Oh, God. wow. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, so when you say that, well, what's your opinion here? What do you think about this? And, you know, he always had a story or word of wisdom to go with it. But uh, I've quoted that a million times. Unasked for advice is interference. And if, if the grandparents are listening to this, say that to your kids. Hey, you know what? You're way past me telling you what to do. So if you want my opinion, ask for it. If not, we'll just keep it to ourselves. It goes so much smoother. Man, I love that so much. And I think, too, when you said even, even during those teen years when they're still living with you, I loved how you approach that, not dictating you can't be friends with this people or you can't do this or you can't date that person, but say – these are my fears about this. I don't know that that's a wise decision because of this, this, and this, or that, 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 but it's your decision. Yeah. Giving them that responsibility to advocate for themselves and then be responsible for the consequences, I think yeah. is very important. Oh, it's uh, when my boys never had trouble with Heather, but the boys, you know, they're wanting to go to parties and do stuff. And I said, you know, when you go to the parties, here's what it's going to be like. There's going to be a group out in the front yard and they'll be fun and laughing and just talking. Then there's the entryway, then there's the den, then there's the back porch, and back porch is where the kegs are, and then the back corner, that's where the, the pot smokers are. I, and <laughs> I said, it's going to be that way? I said, it's like that everywhere? I said, you know, that's up to you. If you want to go to the back corner, you know, good luck. Those are the guys that get arrested and spend a few nights in jail. But I said, and the guys at the keg, they're the ones that, you know, get in trouble too. But I said, once it starts getting beyond where you think you should be, I said, you can come home. You ought to. I said, but it, it's your decision. And it was a fun, my oldest one, Christopher, you know, first time he went to one of those parties, he came back and says, wow, you were right. I said, about <laughs> what? He said, well, you know, it's kind of like it gets progressively worse the further you go into the house in the backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and now Chris is a preacher. <laughs> uh, he, well, he's just, you know, never been, the, he's never been the back porch or the back, you know, corner. He was just kind of 
observing know, compliant firstborn and just said you know you get in trouble doing that so why would i even want to mess with it so but it's it's a fun journey but you you tell them what's going to happen and then you even though sometimes i said you know no i'm sure it's not going to happen if you ever get arrested for doing something stupid you'll be spending the night in jail and we'll figure it out the next day really i said well yeah <laughs> you screwed up i'm not going to get up at three in the morning to come bail you out of your mistake and i mean they knew i was serious <laughs> <laughs> Never had to do it, thankfully, but you know, it's one of those, look, just want you to know this is the way this is going to happen if it goes this way. Okay. <laughs> I think sometimes, though, as parents, we just think, well, if we forbid it and don't let them go to the party, then we're protecting them. But I think that's Satan because oh, okay. they need to see and experience and understand like what life choices are. <laughs> like They need to see that and experience it. One of my illustrations on that one is the controlling fundamental parent that's hanging on to their child and you're just holding them and holding them and holding them and holding them. And sooner or later, they're going to join the military or go to college. And boy, when you let that arrow go, it just everything that you forbade for 18 years, suddenly they're out, you know, to the extreme say, what's wrong with this and this and this. So it's yeah. kind of like uh, uh, what you, inoculations and all that, the, you know, you get a little dose so that you get the the build up the oh gosh, here I'm losing my mind. Antibodies. 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 Yeah. yeah. But with a, as a parent, you're not supposed to keep them out of the world. You know, the, we're not if, if we're going to be monks. Jesus would have said, you know, live alone on fifty acres and never associate. But we're with people. I mean, Jesus's ministry. I mean, he had prostitutes and demon possessed and all kinds of people. He didn't shelter his disciples from it. He showed them how to deal with it with our kids. You know, if you're if you think you're going to keep them from everything bad in the world, sooner or later, it goes away, and they just take off and find out why you were so against everything that they wanted to do. That is so true. And then you have the other side, the parents who bail their kids out of everything. What do you oh, have yeah. to say about that? <laughs> well, they shouldn't. I mean, the Bible says every man will give an account of his own life to the Lord, and really, that starts as a, as a teenager. You know, when they're making their own decisions, you're the advisor, you know, here's you know, career choices, friend choices, morality, habits, all that stuff. But, you know, when they make a decision, you know, it's the wrong one. You just say, you know, that's not what I would do, but that's your choice. So, you know, I, you know, I'll support you in your decision. Don't agree with it, but I support you. And mm -hmm. then when they crash and burn, will you help me? Well, I'll help you understand that you have to clean up your own mess, you know, and we'll be here when, when it's cleaned up. But. I mean, people have to eventually you have to pay for your own sins and crimes. And yeah, and that starts with parenthood. I mean, the, the first authority in our lives, mom and dad, is why was it the fifth commandment? Honor your mother and father. You know, and then it's the preacher, the teacher, the coach, the judge. The, it just works there. But if, if parents are always, you know, you know, my daughter's a teacher and Julie was a teacher. My mother was a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. So I always sided with the teachers. If ever they said our kids were doing something wrong, you know, they, they paid the price for it. <laughs> we we got to let them reap what they sow, right? So they yeah. learn the lesson. My youngest son, the most like me, probably in the wild and crazy. And uh, he's not listening. He doesn't listen to this stuff. <laughs> but now he's a firefighter saving lives. Yes. So oh, that's, uh, that's fitting. That's uh and he says, man, there's a lot of stupid people out there. I said, yeah, there are. <laughs> Do you want to say, we used to be one, son. We were one of those he, was, he was at San Antonio Christian, and uh, his, a buddy of his brought his dad's Corvette to school one day. Yeah. And after school, Jonathan said, can I drive it? And he said, sure. And he oh. takes it from zero to about 90, you know, in that long driveway behind Oh, my gosh. Fields. And, and he's a great driver and still is. He, you know, drives fire trucks. <laughs> <laughs> he was driving hot rods when he was young and now he's driving fire trucks but i mean i was on the speed dial for the principal at the school and every time he'd call hey hey we got jonathan here what's wrong now well he's going a little too fast in the parking lot how fast was he going uh, well it's probably 90 or 100 and then he <laughs> did the loops and i said oh. <laughs> he said so uh he's not going to be able to drive a vehicle on the premises you know for 30 days I said, okay. And then Julie takes him to school. She says, man, this is a punishment on me more than it is him. I got to get up. And pick him up. <laughs> but, 
But he learned it, but it's one of those, you know, what do you do now? He did this. All right, do what you got to do. And, you know, I paid for my mistakes. My mother gave the principal a just carte blanche, you know, spank him as often as you need to. Oh, gosh. <laughs> back, when does. They, back when they abused us as students. <laughs> right. <laughs> now they just reasoned with us. But back then, it was so easy. Bend over, <laughs> three slots, and we're done. <laughs> I remember the paddle. I remember kids in my elementary school being paddled. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, real, mine too. Robert. For real. I did. I got messed up on a Friday sneaking into a volleyball game and coach caught me and went to the principal. And he said, uh, he three licks or three days. And I said, I'll take the three licks. And uh, so I need your parents' permission. And he called my mom. She wasn't there. He called. She wasn't there. And he said, she's not answering. And I said, man, Mr. Thomas, just can we just do this and get it over with? I don't want to be waiting around until next Monday. He said, no. So I sat there. About 30 or 45 minutes, finally, she picked up the phone. And uh, Miss Emmett, we have Robert here. What what happened? Well, he was breaking into a volleyball game, didn't buy a 25-cent ticket because it's more exciting <laughs> to break in than pay a quarter for a ticket. And uh, he's chosen the three licks, just need your permission. You know, she's from South Carolina. And she goes, by all means, you give him whatever he needs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mom. Appreciate the love. I can hear your mom saying that. Yes. I can hear it, Missy. E. By all means, you give him what he needs. <laughs> those were the days. <laughs> those were the days. There was no timeout. There was no spend a day. And uh, where does my daughter and her schools now? It's you're you're suspended, but they don't send you home. So you're oh in oh, school suspension. In school suspension, yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, it takes a whole day. If we could just, you know, get the, the pain. Pain's a great motivator when something hurts. You generally change your behavior, you know, whether it's a broken legs or anything else. But now we reason with them and think about what you did. Look, you did the wrong thing, pal. Remember that. I will. I like like I told the church, I said I was never spanked twice for the same crime. So had quite a few spankings, but never for the same thing twice. <laughs> I want to, I want to ask you, okay. So when your youngest, you got that call from his Christian school that he was going 90 miles an hour in the parking lot doing donuts. Walk me through what that conversation with him looked like that night. That's oh, what I'm funny. interested to know. Yes. Well, first of all, it was, uh, I, I knew the dad and I knew the, his son and I knew the car, the Corvette, and it was a, you know, the brand. I think it was the first year. What's the C, new one's a C8. It was a C7 or C6, but it was back, you know, when they were new. You know, I, I, it's hard, impossible for me to, you know, be critical of his high-speed driving, you know, with, with my record. But we sat down, and he, I said, was it fun? He says, oh, Pops, you have no idea. <laughs> so I, I do. I just never did it on the school premises. <laughs> But I said, we just laughed about it. And I said, well, that's a stupid thing to do. So, you know, he's, I said, I'm, I'm guessing I don't need to tell you. We, you need to not do it again. He said, no, sir. I got the message. <laughs> and he so, was like, I think it was 17 or 18. It was his senior year in high school. I think that's really important, Robert, your response there. Because I think a lot of parents would be like, especially you at that time, leading a growing big church. You could have said, this makes our family look bad. This makes our church look bad. You could have shamed him. You could have, it could have been this very um, big, shameful thing that you did. And instead you met him in the moment and made him realize this was not a good choice, son. I know it was fun, but it was not a good choice. And I think sometimes we get that all wrong because we're worried about what people will think of us and our family and we overreact. And it's just not a good, healthy thing to build with your kids in that relationship. It's uh, preachers have it worse than most because, you know, you're supposed to be perfect and everything. And I always told my kids, I said, you get to be absolutely normal. I said, you can, you know, play Nintendos and hang out with your kids. I don't expect you to be perfect. I said, if you don't want to answer every question in Sunday school class, you don't have to. I said, because, you know, the teacher says, who did this or that? Silence. And they always look to the preacher's kid, Chris, John, Heather. You know, they feel obligated to answer. I said, you don't have to. I don't care. And, uh, but he was, you know, his, his punishment was enough that no driving. And then he had to write a letter of apology uh, to the, the guard that's at the at the front gate there. And I, dear Mr. So-and-so, I'm so sorry for speeding under your watch. It was wrong. It was foolish. I mean, he wrote, right, wrote a heartfelt apology. Oh. <laughs> it's one of those, you, you know, 
and for me, it's easy. I mean, I made enough dumb mistakes myself, so it was always tough to pick on my kids for doing something that I did too. So, you know, I just, I get it, you know, pay your price, you pay your penalty and let's move on. And we did. I just think that's so wise. And often parents can't move on because they start feeling like a failure or, oh my gosh, I can't believe they make this decision. I'm like, kids, they, they're going to do stupid stuff. I did stupid stuff. Deal with it, move on and, and don't hurt your relationship over it. Right. I mean, Jonathan, of course he loves, even now he'll throw it up to me occasionally. He has as as crazy as stuff as he's done. He's never had a speeding ticket. Oh wow! And I mean, he has. <laughs> he could have had you know three speeding tickets for the the speeds he was going, but just never got caught. And he says, "Pops, I've never had a speeding ticket. Have you?" <laughs> <laughs> but not in four years. I'm four years clean, so I'm good. <laughs> You're doing bet Colorado is good on you, Robert. Yeah. yeah. My last one, actually, I got two the first year we were up here. One was in Wyoming <laughs> and the other was up in the mountains. So kind of like, oh, I just got, you know, use the cruise control. If I'm going on the highway, push the cruise <laughs> control and leave it alone. Yes. I think you, this, you know, speaks to what Mandy was saying too, is sometimes as parents, we don't want our kids to know our past discretions. Cause we think, well, if we say that we did this thing, then we're saying to them, it's okay for them to do it yeah. versus I'm, you know, a broken person too. I'm a messed up human too. I've done all the things and that's why I can tell you why it's good or why it's bad. And that's uh, it's the, it's the presentation of your life story. It's the way you present it. If you present it as bragging and proud and look what I did, then they want to live up to mom or dad's. Mm -hmm. Hey, she did it and I can do it too. But if you say this was one of the dumbest mistakes I ever made in my life, and this is how much it cost me, you know, a career move, a change, you know, five hundred dollars, you know, whatever, and and that that cost me so much, I never did it again. So you always put the, I screwed up, but I paid the price. You know, you will too. But my advice is, don't screw up, and you'll find an easier way through life. It's so good, amen. It's so good. Another thing that has stuck in my head over the years that you and I've heard Julie say this too when she came and spoke to our mothers of preschoolers group when we were younger. Which, by the way, that group is where we all met at Next Talk. Our founding yeah. families met at the mothers of preschoolers and Community Bible Church in San Antonio. Uh, I love our moms. God yes. was doing a work there. Sweet Martha Fisher. Every time I would go to her and be like, this happened. I need help. <laughs> no, Martha she Fisher, Vicky, Vicky Rush was a big mentor and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was wonderful. I remember when my daughter was first exposed, exposed to pornography and I had no idea what to do. And I went to Martha and she said exactly what you said in the first of the thing. She said, start a group and just walk through every door that God opens for you. And that's what we've done. I mean, that's why Next Talk exists is because that advice that Martha gave me in her office that day, which comes straight from your leadership about just walking through every door of obedience. Well, it, you know, we all make mistakes. That's why Jesus died for us. But once you, once you accept it, and then you, you know, in a lot of people that is Jesus is their savior, but he's not their Lord yet. Mm -hmm. Y'all heard my story. I was saved at 11. I was guilty of at least 30% of the Ten Commandments, uh, you know, stealing and disrespectful authority in school and beating people up. And uh, the Lord saved my soul. So I was saved at 11, no doubt about it. And then 15 is when I started reading the New Testament. Uh, my grandmother had passed away and my mother was with her. And she said, I read her the, the Sermon on the Mount the day that she died. It was on an Easter Sunday. And I said, what's the Sermon on the Mount? She said, do you know the Sermon on the Mount? My mom you know, grew up Presbyterian, so I mean, she's very, she said, you don't know the Sermon on the Mount? I said, no, ma'am. And she says, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So I got my Bible, the King James Bible. I mean, if I could understand the King James, I mean, God is in it. <laughs> I read the five, the 5, 6, and 7, and I thought, wow, this is some really good stuff. You know, how to treat people and not judge people and promises and all of that. Went back and read all of Matthew, and for the first time in my 15 years, going to Sunday school all the time, first time all the bits and pieces fit together in one biography. And I thought, man, that's when I started reading the Bible at 15, but I didn't really start living it until 19 after that, that summer. And then that's when I said, Lord, if I can understand it, I'll, I'll put it into practice. You know, I used to highlight, especially the, the letters of Paul, I never liked his first few chapters, but I always loved his last few chapters. You know, the first few, it's theology, heavy stuff, and just, man, this guy's deep. The last part is, 
here's how you treat your friends. Here's how a husband is, a wife is. Here's how you raise your kids. Here's how you forgive each other. This is what you should do and what you shouldn't do. And I'm just, you know, used to go through the list and say, yep, yep, yep. Whoops. You know, circle it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you, and I tell people, I said, look, trust in Jesus is easy, but you got to read the, the instructions. And it's, I got a, in our church up here, they give away these little, it's called the life and teachings of Jesus of Nazareth. And it's just pure gospel, you know, stuff, but the guy wrote it. It just tells you everything in chronological order about Jesus. And it's that then. And, and wow. I tell people today, like I always have, I said, you know, you go to school and you get a literature book that's that thick. The Lord of the universe gives you a book that thick. And I mean, how do we dare say I didn't have time to read it? You just pick it up, you know, take 30 minutes and read it and then do it. You know, highlight the instructions and put them into practice. It'll change your it's life. Like, yeah. And it's like you said, if you read his word and you do it, I mean, we overcomplicate it. It's very simple. It's very simple and straightforward. It's the instructions for life. And we just, Put all these extra things in there and overthink it. And you are a living example of read the word and do it and you'll see the fruit. I love, I forget which proverb it is, but it's the one that says people ruin their lives by their own foolish decisions. And then they get angry at God. (laughs) So good. (laughs) There's a loving God out there. Why is this happening in that? Well, let's back up to the beginning of the decision. Let's see where, where we went south on this one. Yes. That's a good teachable moment for a teenager right there, too, yes. as they're, <laughs> you know what I mean? We, 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 I we're we messing Bible it up, and then we're blaming God. Tell me what the Bible says. If you know what it says, tell me where it says to do that or not do that. Yeah. yeah we, our kids, we always you know read a proverb a day, 31 chapters. Proverbs, to me, is just that easiest book. You can, any kid can pick it up, read it, find one verse in there that goes, wow, that makes sense. And then you yeah. just say, Lord, help me do that today. You know, you get into the big books and they're kind of halfway into the story and all of that. But God gave us Solomon to write and just said, look, here are the facts of life. You know, and he covers everything. And, yeah. you say, and you go through those, you know, every month for 18 years, pretty soon. You know, you may not know the chapter of the verse, but you know the wisdom and you practice it. We've been doing it for years. And now I like group text him. Hey, we're on Proverbs this or whatever today. You know, normally it's just the date, but if we're behind or whatever, and then discuss it for 10 minutes at dinner while we're talking, you know what I mean? Because everybody's read it on their own. And then we talk about it. It just, it's so easy to bring God into the conversations these days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The People is because they talked about Bible studies with your children and all, and they Oh, I guess y'all have Bible studies. And I said, no, we never did the Bible study. We did the, the Bible stories at night when they were little kids. And we'd read the story. And I'd ask the questions and give them a grade on it. <laughs> <laughs> Once they hit elementary school and middle and high school, I said, we never had an official Bible study. We just sat down at breakfast. And what'd you get out of Proverbs 16 today? Ah, uh, this or that, or I didn't read it. Okay. You know, but you just, you just, you just speak it. And like the Bible says, as you go. You know, there was never the official sit down, open the family Bible, and there's three lessons. You know, when you're a preacher's kid, you know, anywhere from Wednesday to Sunday, you get the guy's message no matter what. You know, anytime, how are you doing today? Great, let me go through this. And no, I'm good. I'm good. It'll be fine. <laughs> so we just spoke it and lived it, and it, and it worked out. I mean, all three of them have never walked away from their faith. They're all active in their churches. So it works. It works. One thing that you and Julie always used to say, and it has stuck with me over the years, is say yes more than you say no to your kids. Yes, absolutely. It, I got that, you'll see it in the notes. I got that from Zig Ziglar in his parenting book. He said, you should have four compliments for every correction. Yes, I saw that. Uh, so, That's such wow. good advice. You, know, you do this and this and this really well, but this area needs a little improvement. Okay. But, you know, because most of us naturally just everything wrong, we point out the wrong, but we think, well, if I pat them on the back, they'll get overconfident. And no, they don't. They just need to know I'm on the right track. Great job. Proud of you. Happy for you. Love you. You've done awesome. You know, well, I didn't make the team. No, but you tried. You gave it your best. Yep. Nobody can do more than that. And just uh, like I said, but that's that's a Zig Ziglarism. You have four compliments for every correction. You've got to catch them doing amazing things, little things, and praise them so much because it really does build their confidence and you're empowering them and encouraging them. I do that with my grandson. I got 
half our grandkids are high schoolers now. So they're 16 and big and grown and doing their own. Anytime they do something great, you know, I text them, hey, Daniel, so proud of you. Hey, Caleb, man, that's awesome. Glad to do that. Hope you get the job and all this. Love you. I'm proud of you. I'm glad I'm your granddad. And then I get, thanks, Pops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why would I just waste five minutes texting perfection? I called Chris and I said, man, all I get, I get him a paragraph and I get a thanks, Pops. And so at least you get a thanks, Pops. He said, I get a thumbs up. <laughs> or, a, or a, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> If you're getting thanks, Pops, that's a, that's a big it, response. It is. That's a paragraph for them. <laughs> <laughs> so before we end this parenting awesome show, which I feel like we could just go on and on for hours, you have so much wisdom. Any, any other little nugget you want to share with us that you're like, I just want everybody to know this or something that's on your heart to share. Yes. And I forget. Oh, I remember who it was. He's a, an evangelist that was with us years ago. Big old guy, played pro football, but did prison ministries. And he was part of that original, uh, not before the fellowship, uh, the prison fellowship, this guy was doing prison ministry. But he said, uh, guys in prison, never hear what I'm about to tell you. And he said, I hope you will say it to your children and your grandchildren and anybody else it applies to. And it was, I love you. I'm proud of you and I'm glad I'm your father. And I, you know, we did that with our kids. You know, and when they start finishing it for you, when you say, Heather, I love you. I know. And you're proud of me and you're glad. my. <laughs> That's right. Well, I know. And then she does the same thing to her kids. I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm glad I'm your mom. I'm glad I'm your dad. So that said acceptance. I love you. I'm proud of you. And I'm glad you're, I'm your mom or your dad or your brother or sister or your friend or whatever it might be. Amazing. Simple, but powerful. Well, and it goes back to Genesis, I guess, Genesis 49 or 50, when it was a Jacob's pronouncing his blessings on his children. You know, and even some of the blessings weren't really blessings. When you look like Adam, you go, oh, that's uh, <laughs> you're gonna be a wild jackass of a man. And you're going to have trouble everywhere you go. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks, Pops. I uh, appreciate it. <laughs> but, you know, you just bless your children while they're young. And you can never say, I love you, I'm proud of you, and I'm glad I'm your, you're my son or whatever. You can, they never hear it enough. And even when they're quoting it for you, it just, you know, ask yourself, if somebody who really knows me says, I love you, I'm proud of you, and I'm glad you're my friend. It just, I mean, you, know, you were talking about positive in the beginning of this, this mm -hmm. you know, talk. It's just look for the good in people and magnify it, speak to it. You always were so good at that. You always mm -hmm. saw the positive in people that always came out in your sermons, how positive you were. And then you could see that it would translate into your parenting. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's so important for parents to know, because sometimes we do get overwhelmed and, you know, we're working and we're tired and there's just one more thing. And then the teacher's called and it's, but we really have to think about fostering that relationship with our kid and, and not just responding out of exhaustion or anger. And let me add a fourth one on that. I love you. I'm proud of you. I'm glad you're mine. And then when, when it's appropriate, I'm sorry, I messed up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah. It, and parents, you know, I grew up, you know, my parents never apologized for anything. So I'm, I was that generation. Gosh, they're, they're perfect. You know, they weren't perfect, but it was, they were raised in a generation. You just, you know, grownups didn't acknowledge to children that they made a mistake. And uh, I came along and copied my parents' good stuff and the stuff that I could improve on, I did. But, you know, I always told my kids, hey, I was wrong. I messed up. Please forgive me. And I, I'd wake them up at night just say, hey, I really overreacted. It's okay, Pops. I forgive you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Just want to make sure we're good. Yeah, we're good. We're good. <laughs> I love that. The power of an apology is yeah. just... Amazing. And it just it solves the problem and instead of simmering and boiling. It's kind of like, hey, I messed up. I overreacted. I didn't get the whole story. I'm sorry. And just, man, and, and you think, well, they won't respect me. Oh, yeah. It's just it's just the way to live life. If you, if you did something great, way to go. If you did something bad, I'm sorry I messed up. I'll try to make it better. Well, and what I've learned, on. sorry, what I've learned is they'll model that. They'll yeah. model that back. If you're humble and like, I got it wrong when they blow up and they get it wrong, you don't even really have to say anything anymore because they'll be coming back with an apology because that's how you modeled in your home. <laughs> I it was a joke in our house. I said, how come I'm always the only guy apologizing around here? <laughs> messes up. 
No, we got, uh, <laughs> nobody comes to me saying I'm sorry. So I'm always apologizing. Oh, well, you are the one getting all the speeding tickets. <laughs> You just have to have a clear conscience so you clear the air for everything. So I said, yeah, <laughs> I don't want to go to bed thinking I screwed up and didn't apologize or make it right. Well, well that's that humility again that makes it, you so relatable and so encouraging and such a great um, voice of wisdom for us parents and reminding us that it's not all that complicated if we do the simple things things that Jesus taught. If we're humble, if we apologize, if we love our kids, no matter what, and set them on the right path, that's really the bottom line, right? That's like Paul said to the Philippians or somebody, he said, the things that you have seen me, heard me teach and do and seen me do, put those into practice and teach it to others. And uh, you two are living proof. I mean, you're doing that. I mean, you saw it in me and our family. You put it in you and your family. And now your audience is, I mean, who knows how many, but you're making an impact on their lives and that, then they'll pass it on to somebody else. You know, they don't get all the information. They get the ones that they need at the moment and they put it into mm -hmm. practice and then they pass it on. And that's the way it goes. That's how following the Lord works. And thank you for being here today. And I hope you'll be back. I will look forward to it anytime. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Robert. This podcast is ad free because of all the people who donate to our nonprofit. Make a donation today at nexttalk.org. This podcast is not intended to replace the advice of a trained healthcare or legal professional or to diagnose, treat, or otherwise render expert advice regarding any type of medical, psychological, or legal problem. Listeners are advised to consult a qualified expert for treatment.